Amen. Um, I'm going to tell my class what I told uh, Alice, the Saturday class, that uh, I will appreciate it if those of you that have, um, they come in and you don't show your face, that you would put a picture of yourself there. Because when this goes up online, if anybody's blacked out, they don't even show that they're in the class. And for instance, in his class on Friday, he has it, sometimes he has 45 to 50 people. But when they're blacked out, it only shows maybe he has 10. Uh, his Sunday school class does the same thing. And I noticed it the other day. I said, man, there's only six people coming out on the internet. So if you put a picture up, I haven't checked it, but I'll double check and see. But I think the picture will come up and stay there. So, um, some use Bible text or whatever, but it shows your presence there in the class that others, they go on, even though my class just goes straight, what we're doing here, and it goes straight into the net because I don't know how to edit yet. I hadn't, I don't know which program to use or none of that stuff yet. One day I'll learn. But Sister Ivy does the other classes and she cuts, but she keeps speaker or the person that's talking more focused in than I do. So I encourage you to put a, a picture up or a, a Bible verse or something on there so uh, it can be seen as other people from other places are looking in. It, it draws more interest when they see more of a crowd than they would see three or four or five people. All right. Our class today is in, in the book of John once again and trials and denials. It is, as I finished it, studying my lesson, I thought to myself, well, this is a lesson that we all should know. And in what on earth can we get out of something that we are repeating or that we have repeated or we hear repeated every year, but there's always something new to glean from the scripture. Um, actually, as I read one, I thought to myself, I, I'd never read this verse like that, even before I got down to the comments. But when you're studying a Sunday school lesson, you are uh, studying a small amount of scripture. And it also gives you, you're slower. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but when I go to read my Sunday school lesson, I'm reading like Sister Laura reads certain portions there. And you do that with your Sunday school. Whereas when you do your devotions, you're more keen on reading the whole scripture. So verse after verse after verse links to the other, and you're not dwelling so much on one or two verses. That's why in my lifetime, I have practiced and I don't do it all the time. Don't, don't get me, don't, don't quote me here in that. Uh, but every once in a while, I feel the need to, when I have a scripture that I've come across, to just read it over and over and over. And it might be eight verses over and over because there's so much there. You're trying to glean or get from it the message that God wants us to have that's applicable to our lives. Now, once again, I want to reiterate in our class, my desire is not only for you to know the history or to know what is going on in the scripture, but as you know, I'm very, very keen on putting it into practice because that's what the word of God is for us today, for us to put something that we read during the day into practice, into meditate on, to learn from, to absorb. This is what gives us growth because um, there's a scripture that says, when I was a babe, I drank milk. We could only take so much. We could take the Bible stories, we could take whatever, but as I grew, I needed meat. And the only way to get meat from a lesson is to delve into it and meditate on it. And I don't, I don't have to use this word, but this is a word that is very common for us, dissect it so that you can get from it because there are, and my husband's been making emphasis on it for, for several uh, months now, especially with this classes, every word in the Bible is important and it connects to another word or another thought. So I'm just throwing this out as we get into our lesson. Now, we all know about courtrooms, and this is what we're having today is the trial of Jesus Christ. And I'd never thought about it this way, but we know that the courts we know, it usually takes, I'll say it takes months 
It takes weeks to get on the docket, to get a trial ready. Then it, some uh, trials last for months. Some of them last for weeks. Some last for days. Many of us have been jurors on uh, different cases. Um, thank God I've never been on one that you had to send somebody to death or to life. And I'm past the age of having to do jury duty. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> the, all of us um, have gotten that little summons to come and we've had to, to be in a courtroom. But what today I really had never thought about, which, which you, you read and you know, but his trial was only six hours. His trial was only six hours and comparing it to what we go through today to convict somebody and put them to death weeks, and months, and research, and, and checking, and the right words have to be said, and this, and that, and the other, and here Christ, our Savior, was put on trial in six hours. They got him, they judged him, and they sentenced him to death, and I thought, I thought about that, and I thought, how quick we are to accuse and condemn, and uh, this is where I bring in the practical again, how quick we are to judge situations and not analyze and think it through before we pass judgment on certain things. We've done that with our children. Something happens and we haven't, we don't know why they did it or how they did it or, or what motivated them to do it. And right away we judge them and we issue punishment. And don't tell me I'm the only one that's done it because we all have as parents. Right, Sister Grant? You are right, ma'am. Thank you very much. Got one mother that spoke up. <laughs> but this is this is the way it is with parents, and this is the way we as humans are. And this, though, was in the will of God, in the perfect will, because it would have been horrible to know that Jesus would have had to suffer lashes, imprisonment, and not and not been done quickly as it was. So it was the will of the Father. Everything worked out in a perfect plan. So now we go to John 18 and 15, and we're going to follow through with our poor brother, Simon Peter. Uh, Sister Laura, are you there? Yes. Okay. Would you please start reading for us? Until what verse? Until verse 18. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest, and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door without, then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art not thou also one of, his, of this man's disciples? He saith, I am not. And the servants and officers stood there who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold. And they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. It had to be Peter, just like Peter, his uh, vocalness. But when I started reading here, there's something that drew my attention that we skip over many times. What did you think of right away when you started reading that sister floor? Um, the the other disciple that had gone in with him um, that the high priest knew of, I never actually noticed that there was someone in there with him. Okay. Uh, what did you catch first, uh, sister Rodis? Well, what caught my eye was that yes, Peter denied him, but but Peter followed him while everybody ran away. Peter followed him because That's Peter really loved the Lord. And, and you know, he, he was always sticking his foot in, but he followed him while everybody else ran away. That's the first thing I thought of too. Many times it's like um, Doubting Thomas. We always call him Doubting Thomas. There, there are certain things that people label certain ones for. And, and, and yes, all we can see in Peter when Peter started denying the Lord was his denial of him. But there is a foundation here of who Peter was. He followed him. That's what the scripture says. He followed him. 
and another disciple did too. Now, uh, that other disciple we're going to lay aside for the simple reason that there's no name not given in any of the books. However, it is, uh, you can gather from that, that that disciple was known to the priest. Now, it could have been one of the disciples of the 12, or it could have been another disciple, because the Bible speaks of how many other disciples. There's a number there that he talks about. Sister Marisa, what are they? Don't fall out of your chair, honey. Sorry. I'm actually sitting on a chair with my laptop on me because I have no desk. <laughs> what is the number of what? His other disciples. How many were there left? No, besides the 12. Oh, the no, Bible I don't know the it. number. I know, but I don't know the number. Anybody know? 70. 70. And then another time he talks about 100. And 100 well, we know that there was 120 in the upper room. And it speaks, it speaks about different uh, uh, times that he sent disciples out. There was more than one, uh, more than 12. And so we don't know if this was one of, the uh, one of the 11 that was left, which most people don't think it was. They think it was just another follower of Christ that went with Peter. And he was known to the priest that the, the girl recognized him and opened the gate and allowed them in because if not, they would not have been in. So here we have uh, Jesus was he seized in the garden and we talked about that and the disciples fled in the night. Have you ever asked yourself, what would you have done? Oh, I would have followed him. I would have followed him. Would you? Because I asked myself, where was John? The beloved. So when we come, the, our whole lesson is going to boil down to one thought in my mind. is when we come into pressure and we are squeezed to stand, how are we going to stand? And I, 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 I that's like Sister Rhoda says, the one of the first things that I noticed that he followed him even though he didn't have the guts to speak up and say what was right, but he still followed him. So there's a ground here. And we know we have to realize, and this is one of the things I want you as a class to understand when we read the scripture and the workings of the disciples is, number one, Christ had not died yet. Uh, we're talking about the blood covered them after his death. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing is, they were not infilled with the Holy Spirit. They were very carnal and yep. self-preserving. When a person is carnal, they're only thinking about themselves. Yep. How many of you have known carnal people? Oh, my goodness. I think we always do. I was watching. <laughs> I was just going to wonder if I was going to get a response on that. I was, I was watching. <laughs> <laughs> carnal and one of the, the principal signs you can take it to the bank of a carnal person is their selfishness and self-absorbedness. They may do everything else right, but it's all about them and their issues and their problems and their life. And they got to be first and taken care of first. That is, to me, is one of the greatest things that when God sanctifies us that he gets rid of in our lives that becomes visible for other people to see. And that, that I see in the disciples more so than I see anything else was that they wanted themselves because uh, burst of anger, Peter, when he cut off the ear of the, of the, the person in the garden, um, bickering, yes, there was, but anger, you don't see so much, which is a display many times of a carnal person. Um, and you don't see other, other attitudes there, but you do see selfishness a lot. And even in the disciples, why? Because that is the root, honestly, that is the root of carnality. That is the birthplace that everything else springs out of. 
So the disciples were not um, sanctified. So Peter followed. He did what he at that moment felt like he could do. And he followed after him. The sad part was what he did later on, because in all honesty, Peter didn't have the power to stand. He didn't. Because we see a totally opposite Peter in the book of Acts. What did he do in the book of Acts? Raise your hand if you know. Sister Valerie, I see a thumb up. What did he do? He stood against the, the religious Jews when they healed the man. And he stood against them, spoke boldly, and would not deny Christ, and even went further trying to reach out to those who were there. Okay, that was the first step he did, right, at the temple. Then um, we have to remember on the day of Pentecost, who's the one that stood up? It wasn't Paul. Peter. It was Peter. Uh -huh. Why? Because Peter no longer was thinking of himself. Because he could think, I mean, let's, let's, let's think about it. Let's put it in the vision of what's going on in that time. And in the day of Pentecost was a crowded Jerusalem. And already Christ had died and resurrected. And the Holy Spirit had come down. And here he stands. And he, he has no fear for himself that he could be taken prisoner because he began to speak. I'm speaking to you what Joel had said in the, his scripture. I'm speaking to you what it said in the Old Testament. So here he is saying what he could not say that night. Now, bringing it to my class, our class. Many times, it can help to reveal us what we have to ourselves, what we have inside of us, when we're challenged to stand for Christ. Yes. Did you True. understand what I said? Or was yes. I going in circles? No, okay. I understand. It will reveal what is inside. Because right. if we kind of swishy washy it away and we don't stand firm, it shows us that we're weak. I, I, I asked the question, how did he manage to do stay there long enough to say it three times? Deny him three times, kind of wishy washy, you know. No, I'm not. Da, da, da. And the same thing can apply in our stand. And you might say, Well, I don't have that opportunity. Yes, you do. There are all of us have to take our stand at certain times. We stand against what is wrong when we see it, we stand against what is wrong when we hear it, we stand against what is wrong when it's said by other people. We don't have to argue with them. All we have to nicely say is, I don't agree with that. And if they say, well, why don't you? Then you got your chance to express it. But many times, fear. Fear. And that's what happened to Peter. Peter was full of fear that night. Not that I'm feeling sorry for Peter, but I'm trying to understand his state at this time. And that many times as God's people and as children of God, we find ourselves in the same state. And yet we can criticize him, but we don't dare criticize ourselves. And this is where, you know, we have to grow. And I believe I'm looking at a class that is mature. I, we have to grow spiritually enough that we can tell. We can judge our own selves. There's something wrong here, Carol. I need to fix it. I need to straighten it out. And before I go any farther, Brother Miguel, is that a hands up or is that my hand? No, that's my hand from the computer. I always do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now we have Peter where he is uh, following afar <laughs> off. It says in Luke. And then uh, John's gospel is the one that tells us more about what he had done. Um, and he, the other disciple was unknown was known to the high priest. And once again, I reiterate, we don't know who it was, but they granted access to him and Peter was there with him. And so they went in. Okay. Um, then standing Peter uh, in, in verse uh, 17 and 18. Okay. I'm going to ask the question in verse 
Let me get over here, verse three. Who was the first to challenge Peter, whether he was a disciple? A woman, a servant. Damsel. Yeah. Um, she was actually the gatekeeper. She was the one that was letting them in. And she recognized, aren't you one of them? Oh, yeah. And, and why, why do you think she was asking that? Know your history. The way he talked, his speech. Okay. His speech, the way he dressed, uh, all of this was revealing that he was not from Jerusalem, that he was from Galilee. They had different accents, just like I can tell, just as sure as my name is Carol, where people are from, a lot of people are from here in the United States when they start talking. And I can tell when they got an accent, they're trying to hide in there. The other day I asked somebody, you're not from here. Oh yes, I was raised here, but you were not born here. I hear it, I hear it. And that's the way the girl was. She could hear that accent, no matter how long they had worked in Jerusalem, no matter how many crowds they had been among, that still stood out. All right. Be, beware of the way you speak. In the company you, you will stand out. That's a good example. If he kept his mouth shut and just looked at her like, like a lot of people do, she may not have pushed the issue at that moment. But also, God had already said she's going, uh, Jesus had already said, she's, you're going to deny me three times. Okay, then um, we, he comes along and after she kind of, you know, let's that, that, that point go, he gathers up. Now there's something that I caught that was very interesting that I had never paid attention to. He warmed himself by the fire, but the Bible says that, that in that verse, it says in Peter, and who made a fire of coals and that the, um, our writer here once again brought out a good thought for us to be thinking about and it is when there's a bonfire everybody's standing out and away from it but when there is a small fire made with coals and I know that the majority of you are are from the hot lands you're not from uh, any cold lands but cold is when it's lit it gives out a warmth, but it doesn't have a blaze. How many of you done barbecue with briskets? Those briskets are made out of coal. None of you make barbecues? Okay, do you put coal in the bottom? No, I have a gas grill. <laughs> oh yeah, fancy, fancy. What about you, brother Wilmer? Yes. You put coal in there? Yes. And what, what happens when the coal gets lit? Well, it doesn't produce that much fire. It's just like the heat that it produces that, that, that causes a... Okay. That That's what... That, when you get it, you put your woods and then your piece of paper and all that stuff on top and a little bit of that... Uh, Not a fluid. ...stuff and make the flame come all up. But when the coals catch, they begin... Because even in the Old Testament, it talks about the coals being carried in an ash thing and carried as they travel to keep those coals alive. So that they would continue to burn for the uh, tabernacle. That's a whole other lesson. But anyway, the coals here was not a blazing fire. So they had to gather close by to get warm. Putting Peter right in the middle of all those people. He was not standing off to himself. He was right in the middle warming his hands because that's what they were doing around the fire because it was cold. What are you saying? He should never have been in the middle of that group. I don't know if you agree with me or not, but he should never have been there. And what did he do? Instead of when he saw that it was cold and he should, he should have left, but he didn't. He gathered into it. How many times we're not thinking and we're after something that the body might want, and we end up in the middle of something that we should not be in. You see the lesson there in that one? Peter should never have been in that crowd, but here comes another one. 
and he denied the Lord again. I never knew him. I know who you're talking about. So Sister here Carol. we have him. Yes, brother. Yeah, what caught my attention was that he was a woman gatekeeper. And but, back then, maid back servant. Then, she was a maid servant. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, but it caught my surprise that she was like getting yeah. people in instead of a man. And, you know, I actually thought about that instead of a man doing it. Yeah. Today, we got to have a man because we think we need the muscles. But we, we're talking about a different society where they were uh, courteous and they were conscious of other people and they knew there were certain places they didn't go or they were not allowed unless the door was open because then the master would come out and they would be judged and the judgments and those kind of things were very harsh. They were not allowed there. But um, we also have the case of, um, help me Lord here, when I think it was Peter and Silas Peter, Paul and Silas, they were in prison. Help me here. Rhodus, when you go out to the door, they went to the door. Went to the door. Paul, yeah, Paul and they, op Silas? they opened the door and they said, they Rhoda. said oh, Rhoda. Rhoda. Oh, Rhoda. Rhoda. Her name was Rhoda. Peter Rhoda. Out. Yeah, it was when Peter got out. Peter, yeah. not Paul. Okay, when Peter comes out here, it was, it was another girl. It was another girl. Rhoda. It was Rhoda. Rhoda. It was a Rhoda. It was me. It was Rhoda that Rodas. opened the door. <laughs> so it was it was common for a girl to be a gatekeeper or a servant girl. It was, was uh, normal because we they we, it was just a different world in which they lived in, and uh, not what we would see today. If it well, had been clarify, dangerous, go to ahead. Clarify a little, bit, a little bit, mommy, is because. The women were not allowed to go into the synagogues in certain places. And remember now, they're bringing in Jesus, a prisoner for them. Women not allowed, only the elders, those of the ruling class, and those um, religious men were men. allowed. Men. So who's going to watch the gate? Who's going to do certain things? So they allow certain ladies to do it. And that's how come the lady knew that particular disciple mm -hmm. because let's face it that disciple probably was a part of that before they left before he left and went to follow jesus so she's familiar with him because of remember ananias was the high priest at one time yeah so yeah. when they allow the women to do those menial tasks that shall we say the men were busy either in the synagogues or in the court or in presence of like ananias or his son-in-law yeah, and, and we have to remember, which which I read here, there was over 36 acres, which was just uh, where the priests lived. So all of this was like a big neighborhood type of thing. So it would be very common for it had been a servant uh, girl or the uh, child, young lady at the house to have taken care of that. So now let's read 19 through 24. Now we're getting into the nitty gritty of it. The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I speak openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whether the Jews always resort and in secret have I said nothing. Why ask thou me? Ask them which heard me, what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answereth thou the high priest so? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why smittest thou me? Now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas, the high priest. Okay. Well, once again, in, in our lesson today, we're going to have a little bit of a history lesson here. Ananias was actually... Uh, pardon? Anias. 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 Anas. 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 Yeah. Anna was actually the real high priest. Because high priesthood <laughs> was until death. That was the Jewish law. But under the Roman law, which is so typical under laws of people that want to keep people in subjection they made them change just like we have to change presidents so one doesn't become a dictator 
that type of thing. The Romans instituted that. And that's why his son-in-law was the high priest. And if his son-in-law had really been the high priest, they would have brought Jesus straight to him. But they didn't. They brought him to Ananias. Ananias. No. So Ananias. 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 Ananias is another one. It's the other one, Mary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's another one. And they brought it to him first. That is just a little tidbit for your history. Those of you that uh, aren't so familiar with the scriptures or the um, Old Testament and New Testament uh, process of the priesthood. Okay, so it was a lifetime position. And that's why he, first of all, uh, questioned him about him. Now, I find it very interesting if you're bringing the man on trial and the way things did back then, they were accusing him. They wanted him put to death. They wanted him put in jail. But yet he, he asked him about his disciples and his doctrine. Now, what did Jesus have to say about that? Hmm. Uh, Sister Raquelita? I knew you were going to ask me. <laughs> he uh, they he he said that they they knew him they knew what uh, I mean they were asking but they they knew all his teachings so um, he really didn't have to that's the way I see it he didn't have to explain himself. Okay, he did. He, he said, I spake openly. In other words, I have previously told you about what our doctrine is. I ha you have seen me walking around with my disciples, so I'm not going to give you an explanation. Now, those of you that studied your Sunday school lesson, I want somebody to raise their hand and tell me why this priest slapped Christ. That was terrible. I'll hold you there on hold just a second, Sister Ballard. Anyone else? Because the way he, he spoke with authority on, on, uh, on that priest. Okay, but there's, there's more to it. There's more to it that I want you to be able to understand why he, what he did was so wrong, even according to the law. Sister Valerie, tell us. Well, there was not supposed to do this. He didn't have the authority to bring Jesus to court or any accusing whatsoever. He was supposed to have the witnesses speak when it was not a festival. But anyway, when he questioned Jesus, he wanted Jesus really to confess and tell him that he was wrong and guilty and name all his so-called conspirators. But that's not what Jesus was all about. Jesus was protecting the disciples by stating what he said. And the person who hit Jesus, like an interrogation, shall we say, he felt like he was being disrespectful, not cooperative, and made himself like uh, higher than the high priest who was asking him. And that's why he struck Jesus, believing that he was being insolent. Insolent was the word. Yeah, because if we start watching as we're reading, we're going to find how many Jewish laws were broken that night in his trial. Yes. Uh, it was in our lesson. Does anyone remember? Okay, I think it was 15. I, I didn't write it down. Not a dozen more. But I think it was about 15 laws that were broken. Um, this priest had no authority to slap Christ. He had no authority to defend because Christ had not done anything to the high priest except to give him an answer it's just that he didn't like the answer and what they wanted him to do was to admit and christ was not about to admit um in in verse uh 51 um 5 and 31 which is um uh, in john um it says i bear witness of myself my witness is not true by this he meant that from the old testament's legal standpoint a person's testimony about himself does not verify any fact is true which stands today right so his witness was not himself his witness was what he had been doing but yet they were not going to accept that 
they would be his disciples or that it would be those multitudes that had heard. And more than likely, they were witnesses. That's why they were trying to accuse him. That's why we see in this trial that he was falsely accused of so many things. Why? Because they twisted or they acted like they didn't know. How many times does a lawyer stand in front of his, the person he's defending and ask him questions that he already knows the answers to? And he acts like he does, oh, really? And you know, he acts like he doesn't know. Well, they knew the answers. Right. And that's why it was such a farce, this trial that they did. And I, it's sad to say that many people do not delve far enough into reading the scriptures to realize what a farce it was and how unjust right. everything was. Yet the humility, the humbleness, the, the, the attitude of not lashing out or even defending himself that Christ had. So what does that teach you about yourself? Uh, let me get somebody here. I know, Miguel, you hear me so you can talk. Did you go away? No, I'm here. So what was the question again? What were you doing? <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. All right, somebody repeat the question to him. What does that teach you? What does it teach you if he did not lash out? Oh, Talk about Christ not. not defending himself against the accusers that night. Yes, he had, I mean, he was. No, what does that teach you? You. Not to have to justify myself for doing what is right. You know what? We have a very bad habit even of God's people in, in any circumstance of trying to justify ourselves. Yeah. Okay. If we know that we have done what is right and what God wanted, we do not have to justify ourselves. That's right. It's we have done the this is this is what sometimes I get so outdone with is the fact that most people, and I have that confidence in the ones that I that I know, most saints of God do the best that they have knowledge of. And yet somebody comes and picks and picks and picks and picks and picks. And here they are trying to do their best, do their best, do their best. And they've done the best they can. And they try to justify themselves. And then it makes the big old ball, a big old tangle up is worse than ever. But if you have done what you know is right before God, and you are living a holy life before him, you don't have to justify yourself to the world. Sure. You don't have to justify to your co-workers. This is who I am, what God has allowed me to be. And this is, even, even, even some of you don't have to justify you needing time to pray or needing time to read your Bible to your spouse. It's your time with God. And you know, you need to do it. You don't have to just, you know, you know, I need my space. I need my time. Um, if you want me to stay the sweet wife that I am or the, uh, the good husband that I am, I need to pray. You don't have to justify yourself. Not when it comes to the things of God. You do it. And I you think we live in, in, we, we're in a society where it's, we're like the out, the outliers in society and it's meant to make us feel bad. Like when I, exactly. I'll give, and I'll give you an example. When I go out for business meetings, everybody's drinking and you kind of feel like you're supposed to apologize because you're not drinking. I'm like, I don't apologize, but it, they make you feel that way. Like you're doing something wrong because you're not drinking. And I'm like, right. you, need to give why? Us a good, you need to give us a good excuse of why you don't. Right. Like justify yourself why you're not drinking. Like I don't have to justify myself. Why exactly. I'm not drinking. This is actually the normal thing to do is not to drink, but but you're made to feel that you have to justify being moral and being a Christian and being right. And, and, you, and you kind of feel the need to always explain yourself. And we need to stop doing that. Exactly. Because we are what God wants us to be. And, and I mean, we, accept, we don't accept. Let's, we don't approve of what they're doing. But we don't ask them, why are you drinking so much? 
How come you've had six glasses of wine? Why? We don't do that. So why are you putting judgment on me? Sister Kayla? Kayla, you're supposed to be working. <laughs> Where did you go? I am. Um, I am. Um, but um, to that point, like that, what um, Sister Marge was saying is very true. It's all, but it, it's also a very fine line because one of the things that I, I feel that sometimes Christians do is that they think that because, um, and and the defensive part that you're talking about is completely 100% true, but I, there's also that other way where where Christians think that they have to be like this rug on the, a mat on the floor that, you know, because if you look, he did not cower. No, no he didn't. He, didn't he, actually, he actually turned it back on them and said, okay, he didn't lash out, but he did not cower. And he did boldly ask them, if I said something wrong, tell me what I did. Tell me what I did wrong that gives you the right to strike me. He said that. And so it's a balance that I think that as Christians, sometimes like what we said before, because of fear, because be, or we or because we feel pressed, like 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 Marissa gave that example is a very good example because you feel like you have to justify. We don't have to justify anything, but when we are put in that position, like he was like literally in front of everybody being, you know, first of all, struck on the face by, but not even was it the high priest, it was the officer of the high priest as if like, okay, you disrespectful, ingrate idiot, I'm, you know, humiliating him. And he didn't lash out, but he did make a point to say to everybody. He did it mostly for everybody to see. This is unfair because he was, he was God. He could have called it off right there, but he, he know he had to carry it all out. But he wanted everybody it to go on record that this was an unfair thing. You can't. And as Christians, sometimes we take that also route. That's also a, a route of cowardice that I think that a lot of people take. It's like, oh, you know, you know, we don't want a problem, so we don't speak up either when we're supposed exactly. to. And that's wrong too, because right. like you said about the beat, like what you said about the drinking. Why can't I ask? Um, hello, we're in a, uh, amongst your boss. Why are you drinking seven beers? You're gonna make an idiot out of yourself in five minutes. Like that, I would say that. Yeah, yes, I would. If I had somebody that that I'm around with all the time and that has the nerve to ask me that and I'll turn around and say, because I don't want to be, I wouldn't want to make myself an idiot like you are. Do I have to be an AA to, to justify myself and have a token, just feel good? So it's like, a, it's like two ways. It's very hard. You know what I'm saying? Like to find that balance. You're not going to be a doormat. We're not, exactly. you know, you're not, not a doormat, but you have to be humility, but not be a doormat. Exactly. Yeah. Which is what he did. He just basically put them all in their place legally because like you said it was a big like we say in spanish that was a whole show it was all a farce none of it was legally binding none of it was right none of it was, none of it was ethical it was wrong all the way but he did not cower i i, I admire how he answered them that's the part is to find the balance of channeling and that speaking measured but also with conviction and with boldness right it's a hard it, 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 but when you're, when I, it, it's hard, but at the same time, if you're walking in the spirit and you're doing exactly. what's right, the spirit will tell you exactly when to do that little punch. That's it's right. That's what I'm saying. It's hard to explain it, but, but it's like a balance that the, that the Lord shows in that moment. Okay. This is what you're going to say. You weren't expecting to say it. And so all of a sudden it comes out of your mouth and God says it in his word. When the moment comes, I'm going to give you the word. Other words, words, I'll put words in your mouth. And, and many times it sometimes it may not even be a word. It's just a look. Really? You know, it depends on who you're dealing with and what situation you're going through. But we have to do like Christ did. There are times that we're going to have to stand and there are times that we're going to have to be quiet, but, but we will never, ever uh, step back from what we know is right and what we know is just. He did not, he did not cow down and he did not uh, receive that slap as something like I have to revenge myself now. No, uh, words, words are still more powerful, but what is even more powerful is standing and looking straight in the eye of the one that is the, your accuser, accuser. And that's what Christ did. He faced them all when they asked him, and, and, and who do you say you are? king of the Jews? Did he have to give a whole explanation? Okay, my father is the one that created the whole world and that, no, he says, what did he say? You say. Huh? You, you said. said. You said. You said. 
You said it. He's ne he never said that. He says, you said it. You said it. So, see, there are different ways to stand. And one of the one of the things that was we look at as he suffered this and went through this, our lesson is that the fact, yes, we all know about the trial. We all have uh, heard the messages over and over and over and over. We want to get something from it tonight that will help us. God only knows what many of you have to go through. I don't know on your jobs, even with your family, even with your spouse. And it, whatever they may be, it's for God. Uh, God uses these lessons to help you to be strong. If Christ can be strong in the midst of all these, 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 these accusers, there was not a friend with him. He didn't have a defender beside him. He didn't have a lawyer beside him. He was by himself. That's the reason why he took on flesh, to show us that we can stand wherever we are, however we are, whenever we are, and how old we may be. We'll always be standing. Soldiers do not cow down. Soldiers stand. And that's what I want to be as a warrior, to be able to stand to make heaven my home. But I have to do the same thing that Christ did. I have to go through these things and know how to get through them. Let's read our, read our last verse for our sister. Uh, 25, 26, and 27. And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said, therefore, unto him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, saith, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately the, the cock crew. And, and after that cock crowed, what happened? What did he do? He cried. He went out and wept bitterly because conviction got a hold of him. He said, I did what I said. Never I'll deny you. Never, never will I deny you. And he had did exactly what he said he wasn't going to do because he didn't have the power. I go back to what I said in the beginning and it behooves us all. And I look at each and every one of us that, and because my reflection is looking back at me too. Every one of us, I look at you, you better make sure your salvation, salvation is two parts. Your salvation, um, being saved, and then being sanctified. Because we need both to live in the world we're living in. It's like Sister Marissa says, the society that we live in, the people we deal with, we need that infilling of the Holy Spirit. You don't want to have to go out and weep bitterly over your own actions, because he did, over his own actions and the remorse. And you, I can just imagine how he, he felt uh, sitting there uh, in his, his, wherever he was, he sat down beside the road or beside a house or in some stones and he, he cried and cried and he did what his master had taught him. He cried out. I believe he cried out because the next time we see Peter, it's a different story. And I believe that he, he understood a lot of things when he did what he did. And to a certain degree, he had to get to that point to become that apostle that God wanted him to be. And we must be vigilant, dear, dear class, vigilant watching because the, Enemy is not going to make exception of persons. He's as much after you as he's after anyone else and more so. So we have to watch and pray and be on guard and not give in and be like Christ. Stand, stand fully. So that brings us to the end of our class today. Um, I would hate to be challenged three times to deny that I would deny Christ. Um, that would be really be a sad condition to be in as I think about Peter and he's in that condition now. So as we listen to our lesson and we go through this next week, we may know how to conduct ourselves, answer and do. And Ulysses, we're glad to have you in the class this evening. I know you don't understand. He supposedly has a translator there. 
He's in, in case some of you don't know, he's in Ecuador, but he's a Cuban. Hola. Oh. Okay. Greetings <laughs> <laughs> from Ecuador. From, from Ecuador. See, he knows one word from. <laughs> De Miami. Hola, Ulysses. Hola. So let's go to God the Lord. God bless you. God Thank bless you, you too. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we start visiting one another. As we bow our heads, our loving, gracious Father, we are eternally grateful for so many. 